Good afternoon. Um, starting the second part of the session, now we're going to start section three. We'd like to call forward the mediator, Simone, from the Casino University from Italy, and the speakers, Jakar Schoenberg from the International Sports and Culture Association, Ana Moser, Alexandre Machado from the Ministry of Health in Brazil, and Daniela Conti from the Unione Italiana Sports Pertucci, Italy. Now on to the mediator, Simone G. Genadio. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for being here. We are now ready to start our session, that is session number three. And the title is Promotion of Sport for All, What's Commitment, Who For and Why. Uh, my role today is very simple. I'm like a sort of grandmaster of ceremonies. Uh, I will introduce uh, our prominent speakers, and then I will collect your questions, and then I uh, hope uh, we are going to have uh, an interactive uh, and uh, fruitful uh, session. Uh, before giving the floor to our, uh, our speakers, uh, I think I have to spend a couple of words for presenting the, the background of our, our session. As you know, today's sport has been recognized as a, an important uh, right for everyone, for each one, but the recognition is only the first step. After the recognition, we need concrete action, concrete activities, concrete projects, and our speakers are going to, to present you uh, concrete projects that try to promote uh, physical activities and sport activities within a socially disadvantaged disadvantage group. Uh, I'm sure that you are going to receive a lot of inputs uh, interesting also uh, proposal and uh, idea, so I really hope that uh, you will be ready to receive these inputs and uh, you will react with, with interesting uh, questions. I think it's all more or less, uh, I can give the floor to our first speaker, Jakob Schomburg. I don't think that he needs to be presented. Everyone knows him. Uh, he's the Secretary General of ISCA and also uh, one of the brain of some of the most interesting projects that uh, ISCA is uh, developing at the moment. So, Jacob, I ask our, our speakers uh, to provide you with uh, three keywords that uh, will give a framework of the presentation that they are going to, to provide. Jacob, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for the floor and uh, the very nice introduction. Okay. Well, I've been asked to provide three keywords to describe the content of my presentation, and I'm going to break the rule immediately and give you only one keyword. And the keyword for my presentation and the project that I will present is present. Uh, present as is something you give to others. And uh, that keyword is... Uh, important for this project because it's trying to give something a learning opportunity to others. But in order to learn, one needs to uh, receive and understand. So I also have a little gimmick here, and this is the present. This is uh, one of these reflectors that is on bikes. This actually fell off my son's bike before I went here. And this reflector is your tool to learn from my presentation. So I'm going to put it down here. And if you take this and let it reflect on what I'm saying towards what you're doing, maybe you will receive the present in a positive way. So what I'm going to tell you a little bit about is a project that ISCA has uh, implemented. It is uh, called the MOVE project. And basically this project is uh, one that is uh, trying to deliver uh, sport for dis social disadvantaged groups. And I had uh, an interesting experience when I came to Brazil uh, Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday morning I went out for a run in Ipapuera Park and it was very nice to see a lot of people uh, being physically active, walking, running, or cycling, Tai Chi. But I was running with a few colleagues and we discussed also if Sao Paulo, if Greater Sao Paulo is a city with maybe 18 million people I don't think they will all fit into Ibapuera Park. 
And I think that the people that are in Ibuera Park, they looked fantastic. They had the right equipment, the right clothes, they were slim, super. I don't think they are very representative of the population of Sao Paulo. I think that in sport, we have a social uh, imbalance. So people that are socially better off are more likely to be physically active than people that are socially worse off. And this project is trying to look a little bit more at the details of, of that. So just to clarify from the start, the MOVE project, the MOVE word is being used in many contexts, especially by ISCA. And you'll see here that we have a few uh, uses of the name already. Our congresses from MOVE 2009, 10, 11, and 12, but also a campaign that we are uh, delivering now in Europe uh, called Now We Move. And as part of that, we have, have the MOVE Week. But the MOVE project uh, is something different. It is the largest uh, project that we are running in, uh, in Europe uh, today. It is focused on uh, health and we want to increase the capacity of our member organizations to deliver support for socially disadvantaged groups. Now, it's very important to say that it's not only for the partners, it's also a present. And this is the key word from my presentation, so remember to reflect and use the, the present that I'm trying to give. Why do we want to make a MOVE project? Well, we are very lucky in terms of information when it comes to physical activity in Europe. Uh, this map of Europe is showing uh, what is the level of physical activity in various European countries. The darker the color, the less active the population in that particular country. And you will see that there's a tendency the further south or east in Europe uh, you come, the less physically active are the people. So there's a gap. A gap between active countries and less active countries. However, it's not only a gap between countries, it's also a gap uh, according to social uh, divides. And what are those social divides? Uh, they can be socio-economic socio aspects, such as whether or not you have a job or not, such as how high your salary uh, may be, uh, what type of education you have. They can also be socio-cultural aspects regarding to your culture, your religion, uh, your gender, etc. And they can be socio-geographical aspects, uh, indeed, uh, depending on where in a particular neighborhood uh, or city you may live. So this is uh, some of the key words about this project uh, that I'm uh, explaining you about. We are very much focused on socially disadvantaged groups. Uh, we want to have, with this project, the ability to say something very consolidated and evidence-based uh, in terms of physical activity promotion for socially disadvantaged groups. Uh, we have a high ambition in terms of creating not only capacity in the partner organizations, but really delivering something that projects and organizations can learn from uh, in the future. It's funded by the European Union and we have a, a quite interesting variety of partners. Um, these are uh, the associate partners, the main partners, and you will see that we have a strong research and university component with four universities being in the group, and then we have uh, five umbrella organizations uh, dealing with physical activity. The European Health and Fitness Association, focusing on fitness and fitness centers, uh, the European Conf Confederation for Sport and Health. Uh, you have already heard about uh, Street Football World and the Federation of the European Play uh, Industry is the umbrella for organizations and companies delivering playgrounds uh, to communities. And then uh, ISCA is the coordinator of this project. However, we also have some doers, some non-governmental organizations that are delivering physical activity opportunities uh, on a national level and we have a longer list of collaborating partners, the doers, the national organizations that are benefiting uh, from this project and I will not go through them all here.
So, what have we done in the project? Well, uh, we have compiled an extensive literature review in terms of how one can promote physical activity for socially disadvantaged groups. Uh, we have called for good practices, finding out what are the good examples of getting people that are having a lower socioeconomic status to be physically active. Uh, and we have collected quite a few of these examples. So as you will see here, uh, we were uh, quite happy with the outcome of the collection of good examples, of good practices. Uh, 154 practices uh, today. And we feel that this is a good evidence of how much is really being done in terms of promoting physical activity and sport for socially disadvantaged groups. These are some of the descriptors of these projects and good practices that we are uh, looking for. We are uh, now going into the next phase of the project, so learning from good examples, we are trying to compile what are the key learnings and how can they be applied in the real world. So now we shall implement pilot projects so the 16 collaborating partners will get a little seed funding and they will get the knowledge of the partners and the good practices to deliver their own uh, projects, their own initiatives towards, physical, uh, uh, towards socially disadvantaged uh, groups. The work is starting now and they have a little bit more than a year to try and learn learn from the research institutions, but also learn from the good practices that have been taking place before. So they're trying to use the present or the reflex. They're trying to look into the mirror and learn uh, about their own practices. They're also trying to look towards the world to see what have others done that has been successful. I would like to go uh, towards some key uh, conclusions or insights uh, at this stage of the MOVE uh, project. Uh, when we have discovered the way that organizations are approaching uh, their sports projects, we can see very clearly that if you provide physical activity opportunities in a local community, most likely people will show up and they will be happy to take part. But providing an opportunity doesn't mean that everybody will come. And there is a big social divide. There is a big chance that the people that need it the most will not show up to your activities if you just provide it. So we need to do something extra to get the people that are worst off to be physically active. We've learned also that there's a lot of good examples, good practices. Uh, we will compile that into a good practice handbook and hopefully that can be a tool for others to, uh, to learn from. And then we've learned something very important. Sport is not just sport. People that are working with sport and physical activity are coming from many different sectors. So a sport organization cannot own or monopolize uh, sport and physical activity. Uh, we need to understand that also organizations that are uh, organizing patients coming out of hospitals, uh, schools, uh, even doctors, even insurance companies are organizing physical activities. And we should make sure there's a way to work with them and to benefit uh, collectively from the work that's being done. The whole idea behind the MOVE project really is to learn and to make cross-sector collaboration. So we want to make sure that governments are on board. We want to make sure that sport organizations are on board. We should also make sure that education institutions are part of this project. Naturally, the whole health sector, hospitals and uh, private practitioners uh, should be involved in providing physical activity opportunities. And this project is trying to, to create just that. Basically, the present of this project is getting the information from good organizations as your own, collecting it, taking the main learnings out of it, and giving it back to you 
so you can learn from each other. And I think it's also a positive sign of the great turnout of you to come to this Congress is your desire to learn and hopefully to benefit from the present, the ability to learn uh, from others. And hopefully with the MOVE project, we can assist that learning process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jacob. Of course, now you can start sending us uh, questions that uh, we will see together after the other presentations. So now we are going to the second speaker, uh, that is Anna uh, Moser. Just to find the bio that is very long, so mm -hmm. I need to, I need to <laughs> read. Sorry, I tried to 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 learn all your bio, but it's a little bit complicated. So Anna is president of Instituto Sport Educao and a former volleyball player of Brazilian teams. Um, through the activities of the institute, as you know, I'm from Italy, and football yeah. is like a religion. Yeah, but volleyball too, and <laughs> yeah, have I have beat I know. Italy so many times. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> In Italy, you have your mother, then you have God, but above all, you have football. <laughs> sorry for that. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, the Institute offers quality physical education for children, and particularly project for people, I think, and children belonging to less uh, favorite communities. Uh, that's it. The floor is yours. The same, same questions, please. And if you can uh, present, introduce your presentation with three key words, it will be great. Thank you. It's good to be here with you. And the three key words to define my presentation would be, first, global vision, local action. The second would be methodology. And the third, a union, a partnership of many sectors, intersectoral union. So today here, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Institute Sports and Education, what we've been doing. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Athletes for Citizenship in, from the perspective of what, who is committed to what, to whom, and why. Why have sp uh, practice sports? So the Institute of Sport and Education has 11 years. It's 11 years old. It was created as most institutions come about from a need, from a vision, from an idea. And this idea had a lot to do, a lot more to do with, with a way of teaching sports to all the children, a methodology of learning, of motor movement. And when this idea um, went into a community of low income, it it went beyond the 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 court, um, it went beyond the the development of motor movements, but it went into other areas of interest, as such as culture, health, protagonism, and social action. We, we started with the vision that sports is the right of all, guaranteed in the Constitution. We also um, started with, with a public from public school with children, especially with children and young people, and people who study in public schools. And right there, we already have a pretty large um, audience, a target audience. If we start now, we may take 15 or 20 years so that everyone is well serviced, but that's our perspective. We bring here also a, the um, a little bit of the beginning of the dimensions of sport, which is not something new, but each dimension has its own objectives. So, so um, high-end sports, the objective is performance, but that's their main 
uh, objective there are others the the same one the, from participation sport is leisure social integration and the main objective of the educational um, sport is development and education the important thing here is if they have different goals therefore the strategy should be different so that's the first aspect to be considered and starting from that the Institute sports and education it has as its main um, goal educational sport I want to show you here just so you could have a general view it's my vision of how of, of what we have in Brazil when it comes to manifestations of sports and the people responsible here we have this pyramid which could be controversial maybe it could be a different geometrical shape to represent this maybe this could cause some division but it's just a geometric shape and it brings uh, uh, some some issues is that the base of the pyramid that's where the population is and as it goes up as you start selecting um, the, the sports manifestations become more complex therefore here at the base you have educational sport and participation depending on your age range all the population according to our constitution have the right to have sports who takes care of this clubs associations foundations universities schools and public programs and private programs ONGs and NGOs SESCI and these are the people responsible for this at a, a second um, stage you have regional and school competitions um, regional um, state city competitions we have some examples of this in Brazil in Sao Paulo we have city games in other places we have open games regional games we have some leagues not 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 the federation system the formal system uh, I'm sure each place in Brazil ha have one of these manifestations that are organized and who takes care of this is confederation federations of amateur sport and then we we at the national and state competition they are responsible the feather federative um, is responsible for that and then you have the high performance um, sport which are the confederations that are the main responsible parties um, the the base sport talk about this in our vision there are many manifestations of this all these or better yet all these manifestations in some places in Brazil but we don't have all these manifestations in in all the part in every part of Brazil um, servicing the population that could participate in different dimensions and one of the discussions that we could have about this we're not going to get into it right now but is the is where the um, base sport is or where the athletes beginning sports are that in our vision it's it's upper in the pyramid and not below in the, in the lower level it's up here and not down here where um, sometimes you find it Some, at the school you have the the school teams but there's nothing else for everybody else to do so while the initiation of athletes is down is here in our opinion here you would you would have uh, an initiation and it's different from the motor because it specializes and for athletes uh, um, for a certain kind of sport so what is done up here cannot be done down here or else you start a selection you start selecting at the base and you already kill any possibilities of starting also to bring this as a contest for our dis discussion I'd like to present quickly present what we do we have some different dimensions in terms of 
our actions. The first one is direct service. We start with direct service and train teachers for this type of service. We have partnerships with schools and community spaces. Right after that, we go on to train teachers from others, not only our teachers, but teachers from other cities. And we started this in 2004 to train teachers from San Sebastián. I just saw a guy from San Sebastián. I don't know if he's here. But in 2004, then we went on to Itachiba and Rio de Janeiro and started training other teachers. With this, we were able to have a direct relationship with the government as well. So we always had an influence on public policies and articulation and sensibilization. Of We worked with networks and we developed material and technology to be used as a reference for the sector. Our mission is to contribute for training through physical education and sports, favoring communities, low-income communities, training and, and forming citizens, we're focusing on physical education and developing people and communities. And in 2010, we had a strategic planning, thinking about scale gains with Shaka and McKinsey, and we developed this vision, which is to lead the universalization, universalization of educational sports in Brazil, because some organizations don't disclose or don't market their vision. So more than saying that we are capable of doing this, this is a beacon that will guide us to towards what type of project, what type of effort, what type of, what type of vision can we develop within the Institute. Not that we can reach all of Brazil one day, but we think about strategies that are doable, that are possible to be implemented throughout Brazil, and we work with projects. So we have here several different projects, which is how the Institute is financed or funded. Half of these are done through the in incentives through sports laws, and we have a great partnership with Petrobras as well. These are projects for services. These are projects that work with sensibilization of the policies and, and training managers and teachers, and several several other initiatives to develop material. We have around 16,000 direct services, half of these with teachers that are direct, uh, hired directly through us and some other part of, this is done with t partner teachers within the projects and in events such as the sports caravan which has the, gr the highest numbers we also cater to a certain number of people and we also train almost 20,000 teachers in 19 states 129 cities we believe that this impact is even greater than that. These are very conservative numbers, but because indirectly, these are movements that end up being being left behind, regardless of our participation. So our strategy is to mobilize, especially the public educational network, where the, this is where the students are, this is where the teachers are, this is where we need to develop and train people and create mechanisms and routines that uh, are able to, co to coordinate continuous training within the, the city school systems not only for the po political managers or from the parties, but with part political participation and ensuring the rights and participating to improve everyone's lives and partnerships with the public sector or with the government. And some of, so some of these projects, this is done in, part, in a partnership with Petrobras, where we have, where we develop alliances in the states. We are in the Amazon and Bahia and Rio de Janeiro, then Pernambuco and Rio Grande do Sul, where we qualify a local institution, in, the case, in this case, a university or a college. And with this local 
local partner. We train teachers for seven or maybe eight cities within that region. So you create centers for educational sports. The car sports caravan is a more local action, but it's been going on for seven years in 16 states, more than 70 cities. And through UNICEF, we develop a relationship that is very broad throughout these urban center platforms, the CMA seal that reaches the, only in the Northeast, it reaches over a thousand cities. And this, pro, this cities of for the World Cup project where we are reaching out to local actors for the host cities for the World Cup, we're, final, we're in the final stages in Brazil, we're going to start in Porto Alegre and three other cities next in the beginning of next year. Uh, searching, looking for for funding to do to work with the uh, cities in the northeast, which have less uh, sponsors interested. For whom do we do this? Sports impact, when it's structured and well organized, it impacts children, teachers, due to its social function and its condition. It impacts public services in those areas, in those cities. It impacts other institutions, local institution in our case, in the strategy for the multiplying network. These are different, different fronts, different stakeholders that are impacted. They are positively impacted by these projects with these strategies that we develop to spread educational sports. These are some of the publications. And a network, network, networking is very important. So we develop the global vision of what of what is appropriate for each region in Brazil, for each different characteristic, for different so small, medium, or large cities with urban areas, rural areas, teachers that are trained or are physical education uh, professionals or not, young monitors classroom teachers, managers, education managers, administrative managers, planners. So we've been dealing with all of these different types of people and trying to develop and apply strategies and methodologies to make sports possible, to make sports feasible, to reach where the children are. The action has to be local. We are not going to reach all of Brazil if we don't touch all of Brazil, if we don't step in the mud, if we don't get our hands dirty everywhere. This is a political view of transformation. How do you transform a country? How do you change Brazil with methodology and trying to reach every single place? This is what the Institute does. And one of the main networks, that two of the main networks that we uh, deal with are the Athletes for Citizenship, Atletas pela Cidadania, and the Network for Social Change, which are partners in this event. And we have a very, a very well-defined strategy for this. How, how long do I still have? <laughs> These are all the athletes, about, there are around 50 athletes. We promote ex pra example practices, we mobilize, we give examples. This is our mission. And we want spo the sports, a, a sports culture that is accessible to all. We organize this according to goals, so we are challenging the government, we're mobilizing the society and mobilizing every single sector in society around these goals. There's sports in every single school for all students all over Brazil, trying to double sports practice for the general population and trying to put together every movement and every effort at this time pre these great events so that we can establish the basis so that after these great events we can be left uh, incre with increasingly developed sports 
in Brazil. This is where we want to place the, the, that image of the pyramid guaranteeing and ensuring uh, this is in, where, where this is ensured by in the budget and in, in planning and effectively defines a path so that even it, we don't depend on programs or actions of one or another government. So this has to be continuous. The, the, we work with mobilization of society or political movement and research. Different campaigns and actions are being organized and are underway. The national campaign is going to start beginning of next year. We've been to all the capital cities signing commitments with those goals with more than 90 percent of those of the candidates uh, to of mayor candidates then we're going to work with these managements next year uh, sports awards meetings portals in terms of political articulation, to work for the sports legacy and the city of sports program, which is going to monitor the host cities and all the cities that would like to adhere to this proposition with indicators and goals to for management. And we're going to follow up and publicize and disclose what is being done. And several other surveys for sports and, and schools and activities that have already been done, physical education that is being discussed with some uh, uh, with a few partners, sports systems around the world, and how how the equipments are in the host city, knowing. Uh, knowing this uh, database and having more knowledge to legitimize the debate around this cause. So these are the actions that I just mentioned and research production. And with this, we hope that we are able to construct an actual legacy and to build an actual legacy that will not end with the mega events but transcends them because we know that nothing is built a, a, a sporting or educated country, this can't be achieved in a short period of time when we're far from that, we're far from this, we still have a long way to go. We've reached a lot of, we've achieved a lot of things in the past few years, but we still have a long road ahead of us and we're only going to be able to reach the end of this road with methodology, with global vision, vision, local action, and with the unity of the several different institutions that make sports, that do sports and promote sports and service these people and go, moving our focus back and to and having the priority to, having the priority as uh, sports for human development. So we want to develop a model that is replicable, increase sports activities in schools, and involve the cities, and monitor and follow up on what's being done. I think it's we're well overdue. We've, we're two years away from the World Cup. We're less than four years away from the Olympic Games, and time keeps keeps moving on. So the society is effectively mobilizing, and we ha we're very anxious for governments to take action and take this issue seriously. And as a priority and a path for development, we are very anxious to see this happen. Not to say this, and I'm saying this just to be nice, with all the people from the governments that are he that are here. And we really, really hope that things happen. We have the means, civil society that is organized. We can develop a lot of technology, very good technology. A lot of people are doing a lot of good things throughout Brazil. And this needs to be, this, they need a home. And the home is the national system, national sports system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And sorry for my mistake, I'm sure you are
was a good football player. Yes, I was. <laughs> uh, before passing to our next speaker, I invite you again to send us your, your questions, also your comments, if you have comments. Please use the form that you have at your disposal and uh, send us your, your feedback and inputs. Now we are ready for the third speaker, that is uh, Alessandri Machado Rosa. Sorry for my pronunciation. Oh. And he's technical consultant of Pan America Health uh, uh, Organization and representative of the Ministry of Sport. What is interesting, I think, to underline is, uh, uh, is that he is also author and organizer of the book uh, Sport and Society, Social Cultural Action for Citizenship, that I think is a topic that is very relevant for, for our session. So the floor is yours. Thank you. How do we um, convince uh, um, people that, uh, that being physically active also means more health? Um, the Ministry of Health over the past years, especially um, coming out of the 90s into um, 2000, um, from the 20th century to the 21st century, 21st century, Brazil lived in an accelerated process of transformation. It's what we call three fundamental transitions from ep epidemics. So Brazil um, leaves a tradition of infectious disease from a tropical country like Brazil, from a transition of leaving these inf infectious disease like yellow fever, um, dengue, we still have a problem with that, we have malaria, and a series of infectious contagious disease that originated and were responsible for the organization of the health system in Brazil. So we live a tr moment of transition where these infectious contagious disease are no longer the, the, the main disease in the country and we start to live with um, chronic non-transmissible disease like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, um, locomotive disease and we start living with these kind of sickness that at other times had other names um, but that are basically chronic disease that are non-transmittable. Um, we also started living at the turn of the century, the transition uh, demographic transition um, accelerated. The Brazilian population lives a process of aging that is going to have a big impact in about 20 or 30 years. It's going to have a big impact in of the of the age age range compositions in Brazil. So uh, a population that always had a young characteristics of with many young people for many decades, it is now. Um, start the age ranges in Brazil um, below 14 is correspond corresponds about 24 4 percent of the population the older people above 60 are 11 percent of our population a big part of uh, of the Brazilian age range is the economically active age range which goes from 15 all the way to 59 more or less uh, that's 64% of our population is in this bracket, but the, the demographic um, transition shows that the dependents below 14, um, they, the number's been falling drastically. The average of children and families and women in Brazil is not even two um, children per family. It's below two. That's uh, the standard for Europe, about 1.9 um, per woman children per woman or so that means that we have uh, a stagnation of, in our population below 14 the dependent population and you start to invert the pyramid the the population starts aging and that's the process we're in and the process that we will probably grow bigger over the next 20 or 30 years and impact 
the life of the country with a big number of old older people. That's the demographic transition. And we also have of urbanization, accelerated urbanization process. Today, 80% of the 5,500 um, cities in Brazil have the characteristic of urban cities with all the, the negative aspect that this can bring. But most cities today are urban cities and all the running around, the cars, the kind of food people, people start using in Brazil is industrialized food. Is what we call a, uh, tr nutritional transition. So we have three transitions in the country that are impacting the way people live. And what does this mean? This means that um, uh, an increase in chronic disease, one of the big problems is obesity. obesity. That has been um, one of the big problems in Brazil and in, in the West especially. Obesity has been a characteristic of the population. An increase of overweight and obesity have been a big problem in the public health. So the question is, the big challenge is to increase the level of physical activity. But how do we do this in the population? How do we do this? There's strong scientific evidence that, that physical activity, it brings benefit in the medium and long term benefits to the functioning of the human body when it comes to protection against some kinds of cancer. Um, heart benefits, mental benefits, and there's strong evidence that supports that regular physical activity um, fosters health. That's evident. As the, the weight increases in the population, the idea is to is to transform people so that they have a way of life that's more active. Um, in the morning, Professor Janini, he said that, he talked about the etymology of, uh, of the words, how their meaning changes over time. And um, this, these last days we were discussing in the Ministry of Health because we were looking at some regulamentation, regulamentation and some technical documents of the ministry because the word sedentary and we had to use physical inactivity and this caused a bit of uh, a, a, a polemic um, and the conclusion was that the, the word sedentary has many interpretations has more than one and and the effort of mankind was worked towards becoming sedentary. People were were Normans. The, the human groups were nor Normans, and as they developed um, agriculture techniques and, and cultivation, they started becoming more sedentary. They started um, being stopping at a certain place and staying there, and that's and building cities. So mankind had all has always fought to become sedentary to tra and, and become sedentary even in Australia for example the big the, the occupation process in Australia one was to to prevent the the aborigines to to lose that Norman um, culture and become more sedentary so the civilization effort of, of mankind, was for us to become more sedentary. And today this word has become a negative word. Um, and, and being sedentary, is, uh, you cannot be that today. But how do you treat this dilemma if in a society where you live, um, in modern society, it lived the process of recognizing the individual. 
the recognition of the individual is a is it's a victory from the liberal revolution, um, revolution, the French Revolution, to recognize the individual. So how can I tell this individual what he should do with his body? Why do I have to tell him? what he should do with his body. If I recognize him as an individual and people's lifestyle, theoretically, they have freedom of choice to make um, freedom of choice to make their decisions. So if I want to be sedentary, why is that wrong nowadays? So the word sedentary, it, it can have different anthropological and sociological and cultural um, meanings from the perspective of history. From the perspective of public health, it would be irresponsible for our ministry or any other ministry, for that matter, to just close their eyes and ignore um, to this imminent problem, which is the advance of chronic illnesses, especially obesity as a factor of risk. Um, for the development of other illnesses. So before this, um, we need to tell the population that they need to be active. But most people hear this in TV, radio, um, and, and then here in Sao Paulo we had an experience called Agita Sao Paulo, which was basically based on communication and, and campaigns. But people know about it. They hear about it at some point that being active fosters health. But why don't people get involved and engage in this more active lifestyle? So the chronic li um, illnesses, non-transmissible, are one are the biggest problems in the world. Um, we have data from other countries that show that this is one of the biggest problems of mankind when it comes to public health. So one of the big um, possibilities for controlling these kind of disease is to uh, um, increase the amount of physical activity, especially in Brazil. But how do we do that? How do we, this commitment to to change this, this advance of the chronic illnesses is the commitment of whom? Um, evidently of the of the state just as a starting point but how do you make people get engaged in these programs we have some data here for uh, physical inactivity that was gathered by Vigitel here, the risk factors in Brazil Vigitel is is uh, is uh, is uh, is a research that they do through phone and they call people from the capitals. In this research, um, you see that the the population, the levels of inactivity of physical activity, regular physical activity, is only 18 percent. It's very low if you think that obesity and overweight is over 50% of the Brazilian population. 50% of Brazilian population is obese. Their IMC is above 40%. So it's already at a level of obesity, but more than 50%, including children who are in school, are overweight. That's a situation that um, the that is qualified as an endemic, uh, a global endemic. And, and this is the big risk factor to develop other um, disease, heart disease, motor disease cancers and, and rashes and stuff like that. It's a big risk factor. The health ministry, um, in the light of this, produced a document which is a strategic action plan to for chronic disease in Brazil. And this program goes until 2022. The, the goal is to increase the level of physical activity of the population, build um, areas where they can have access to, to um, nutrition, education, and sport education, and a better way of life. And one of the strategies of the plan is to develop um, the society 
society. That's our strategy. And the fact of the Ministry of Health today, uh, the Ministry of Health today being here, participating of this, is to help in the development of society to fulfill the, these goals and so that the population is educated and has access to spaces where it can develop, diff um, change their habits and, and have better, more healthy lifestyles. So these these, these, the data here um, show us that we have a lot to do because to engage the population to transform their life. Look at São Paulo, for example. The city of São Paulo today has almost 12 million people. This metropolitan area of São Paulo uh, is it's just humongous. If you fly um, over São Paulo, you spend more time in traffic than sometimes um, traveling 3,000 or 2,000 kilometers by plane. It's a stressful city. It's a very complicated city. It's not stressful? No? I, I'm from Sao Paulo. And we get used to it. For those of us who are from here, but it's a city that if we think that more than 80% of the Brazilian cities are urban cities and Sao Paulo is, a, is, is just humongous, these habits um, that we see here, we also find them in other cities. They're reproduced in other cities. If you travel around Brazil, you will see um, like Rio, for example. It's a wonderful city. It, it used to be a wonderful city, now it's a chaotic city. Um, other cities of the interior, like Campinas, which is a big city, is the biggest city in the interior of Brazil, they have 5 million people. It's a region that's very stressful as well. So we have to think as a strategy, as a basic um, strategy, is to build healthy spaces, spaces where the community can effectively meet to promote health. The big, the biggest challenge, um, actually, the I was asked for three key words. I would say that these three are key. Promoting health, understand what is to promote health, healthy space, SASKI, for example, is an institution that that is a, a healthy space and physical activity or corporal practices, as we prefer saying in the health ministry, um, for it's, because it's more ample um, when it comes to culture. So the program that the uh, um, Ministry of Health it was something that started, in a program that started in 2011, in answer to to the strategic plan of to combat chronic disease in Brazil, so the program so this program is a result of some um, positive experiences from Brazil. So you have the Academy of the City that started in Pernambuco. We have the the. Um, in orientation, exercise orientation program in Vitoria. In Curitiba, we have Curitiba Ativa, Active Curitiba, which was a reference that we used. We also have um, the city gym from Aracaju, and we have another experience in Rio, which is the Carioca Gym for Health. So we have these programs, we, we, these, these programs that were the basis that gave us the base to make this health a, a gym. This started in 2011, and it differentiates fundamentally. It's a it's a health unit with your the basic health units. Um, it's for it's also considered health equipment. It's part of it. 
And this space, which we hope is to articulate, help articulate the community for ways of, of living health healthily with where physical activity is important to motivate the population to have physical activity. These are some actions that are part of the strategic plan. So we have uh, the program Health in School. And here the basis that the um, WHO orients for the, for the um, base, these programs that are based on the population and the community where you intervene to change ep epidemiological um, situations and, and to stimulate the population to have a healthy lifestyle, lifestyle with with um, local experiences and valuing what that community produces. So the big strategy today of the Ministry of Health is to pay attention to, or to what we call basic attention where you work in promoting health instead of intervening in in the illnesses when people are already sick because and then you start taking care of people um, based on their illnesses so this situation the idea is to do the contrary the idea is to promote health and to prevent um, illnesses that's that's the the new logic that's it's, it's orienting the policies of the Ministry of Health and this program is how this ha um, has been has come about that's what I wanted to say I hope I was able to explain to you why the Ministry of Health is today part of this global movement to increase the levels of physical activity in the population thank you very much uh, also in this case we have a long bill just to, to mention a few things uh, uh, she, uh, she was project manager of the European project called Olympia, which produced the European Chart of Women's Rights in Sports, and also project manager of the European project Mimosa, that, that tried to promote social inclusion by using sport-based projects. So, Daniela, the floor is yours. So, we'll start with the time. So, obrigado, and that's all. So I will speak in English. My Portuguese is very, very few. So I start with uh, the three words you ask. So my words are inclusion, network, and happiness. And now I, I can try to express why I choose these three words. First of all, I will talk, maybe. I don't know if I talk. It's okay, yeah. I will talk uh, um, a little bit about this project that more than describe you, the European project, I want to uh, give you some input to, to, be, to do a, a common reflection on, on our work. Uh, Mimosa is a project uh, funded by the European Commission, the Unity Sport, and it's about how to uh, find measures to include migrants and refugees in, in sport. Was, uh, uh, and uh, in, uh, in June, there's a lot of partners you can see here. ISCA was uh, one of the partners. And uh, uh, we've got a lot of goals and we reach outputs, uh, a methodological guideline and uh, um, a research, very interesting, doing in Italy and in Spain, and an ethic code. Uh, I bring with me, I don't know where there are, some of the methodological guides in English and in Spanish, but on the website you can download all the materials and find more information about the project and uh, the methodological guide was translated in five languages so not Portuguese because we don't have any uh, partners from Portugal but uh, you, you can see the other languages maybe it's good so now I want to start with uh, this flash I want to give you so, first of all, um, sport and social inclusion. We talk in this project about migration, refugees, asylum seekers, Roma communities. And normally, when you hear this word, there's another one behind, that is problem. Um, migration is a problem of security. Migration is a problem of social inclusion. Migration is a problem. I want to start thinking in another way. 
that migration is not a crime. So the real problem don't come from migration, but from other things. So first of all, um, countries' legislations uh, put barriers for people to move in the different part of the world. In Italy, for example, just to give you uh, a flash, um, we've got a, a legislation who say that if you born in Italy, but your parents are not Italian, not communitarian, you are not Italian. So we got this uh, use sanguinis. It depends from the blood if you are really, really Italian. And that means that people at 18 years old, they have to go to police to ask for the permission to stay and to start all the things to have the uh, citizenship. So that's the first problem. The second one is, are the federation rules uh, in Europe, I don't know in, in Brazil, I'm sorry, but in Europe we've got this regulation that put barriers for the presence of um, um, not communitarian players in, in the team. But this is also in the amateur league. Um, I'm, I not agree personally, uh, even on the professional part, but talking about amateurial uh, league and activities, that means that uh, people that just want to have fun in doing sport can't attend to the tournament. So this is for me a problem. Uh, another thing is the media. Uh, unfortunately, media spread an image of migrant that is sometimes very stereotypic, stereotypic, typic, oh, my English is very poor, and, uh, and they put the accent uh, on problem. Um, if you want to do a joke, uh, just count in the article of the newspaper how many people enter in your country. At the end of the year, we will see that, for example, in Italy, we will have something like 20 million people. But media never say how many of them are in Italy really, or they go in another country, why they came in Italy, and so on. So the presentation of the data is only doing it in a very terroristic way, I can say, and that not help in the building of an image and create only fear in people. And then, of course, talking about Europe, sometimes we got a neurocentric culture. Um, talking about Italy in particular, we don't have um, multicultural education in the school. So that's create, again, barriers be between the people because there is a sort of fear of the other. So for, for us, for my organization and also for the work that we have done with our partners, migration is a right. It's the right of everybody to decide and choose in which country live and, and why and to escape if we talk about refugees and asylum seekers from situation of war, famine, abuse, and so on. So now sport, maybe. Yes. Sport, for us, is very much important to over, overwhelm this kind of problem. And for us, sport and social inclusion is moving people, moving culture. I take move, of course, as basic words. Because um, sport, uh, we saw in our uh, activities in the project, sport, uh, all the sport organizations participated do activity uh, increasing the real participation of migration, even in a creative way. Sometimes they have to invent activity to overwhelm the legislation and the problem we see um, above. Um, they, they prepare very good campaign of raising awareness and a very good project in education, in training, in participation. So we can say that in Europe, in our organization, the participation of migrant to the real life of sport is very high. Of course, we have to work on it, but it's possible to have a very good participation. The real problem that we've got, because a sport could be an instrument for the capacity building of migrant community and to strengthen their skill. In this moment is very much difficult because uh, we have to create new projects in, in order to achieve this goal. For us, sport is an opportunity for job, but the real problem is how to involve uh, this target group 
and uh, leadership position because only working directly with them we can uh, overwhelm the, the problem that we've got. So we have in the future to create projects that give more possibility to migrant community to participate also in the leadership position and in the end um, sport help the increasing of health and wellness for refugees and asylum seekers. Working with them in a sport activity, we observe that for some people, if they want to participate in a, in a sport activity, they have to go to a doctor to have the, the permission. And for many of them, it's the first time they go to a doctor, and so they start a sort of um, preparation, and, and for the first time, they take care about uh, their own health. So that's another point very much important. Um, the added value to, uh, of this project, I go very fast, maybe. So first of all is network. That's the, my second word. Because of, uh, this recommendation we prepare are very much important. They are realized with the help of the sport organization and the local authority and the university. And for us, uh, to combat this uh, particular problem that is racism and discrimination, we need really the cooperation of all the social actors. The sport organization alone can solve the problem. We need the local authority, the national authority, and of course the European Union to do uh, an integrated project. And with this handbook we realized we wanted to give very clear information and recommendation on how to improve uh, the, the clubs, the sport organization work, and which kind of projects uh, could be done in the future. I'm a bit long, maybe? No? <laughs> so, um, another point is which are the problems that we have to overcome in future? We talk a lot with our organization partner, and I, again, I'm sorry if there are some journalists here, but again, the main problem are identified in the media. We need the, to work with media to spread another image and to present uh, sport as a really key uh, tool in overwhelming the problem of racism and discrimination. But uh, sometimes the media, especially the media in sport, present the, the sportsman in a very stereotypic way. Um, I heard many times when I, uh, I watched football matches uh, involved um, African teams, some commentary as, oh, look at the, uh, at the fans, they are very colored, they are very naive. I go to the stadium, in the Italian stadium, and Sometimes I am very naive and I am very colored because when I'm in the stadium, that's the way to express it. So why the Africans are naive and not me? That's something that sometimes um, I heard in the presentation. Or uh, another stereotype is to present the Kenyan runners are very good because they go in the mountains without the shoes. And so that's why they are so fast. If you go in Kenya and you observe the training that these people do, it's not because they are without shoes, it's because they train a lot. So we need media to change this image. And, uh, and at the moment, we have to prepare also maybe project, integrated project, workshop, or other things. Another problem we observe is that there's no data and researchers at European level on migration and sport. It was so difficult to have real data on it. And I think that it's very much important to have data because as we've seen with all the projects we um, did uh, with ISCA about health, if we present data that sport is good for health, of course it's also easy to gain more fun, to do more activities. So we really need to explore this argument. Um, and of course, we have to give some input to change the diffuse culture that you've got, so combat really the, the, the racism that we've got in our country. So, just in quite in the end, um, for, for, for this project, for my organization, uh, to solve this problem is important. Uh, to involve directly the target groups. 
inside our project and and to listen then and to to learn from them um, because that's the only way to create new projects in order to over overhaul the the problems that I express in advance and just to give you some positive example came from Italy and from uh, my organization we observed that um, in Italy cricket is not very well uh, sport but is uh, is the sport of the Asian community and in the last year we saw that uh, with the creation of sport clubs directly managed by the Asian community this sport grow up and that's very much important and their uh, needs help us to understand better also our towns because one question they, they, they do is we don't have sport space for cricket but if we analyze our town in Italy, we don't have enough, enough sport space apart the sport clubs. If we talk about our town, we don't have space enough to practice sport. So maybe talking with them, we can also solve some problems that we've got. Another case is the swimming pools open only for women. That was an experience in Turin, and it was a request um, from um, the Muslim women, the, 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 the Muslim community uh, in Turin. They ask for the possibility to do sport and especially swimming. So the, the WISP uh, local committee decide to open on Sunday morning the swimming pool only for women, not for Muslims, but for women. Um, at the beginning, of course, many Muslim attend even because they can leave the children uh, with the sport operators, of course, all, all the people inside the swimming pool uh, is uh, women. But after a few months, the director of the swimming pool observed that also many women in general attend to the swimming pool. Uh, maybe women who uh, has violence, abused, physical or psychological, adolescent that don't love so much their body. And in the end of the experience, now it's two years, they create a community of women who talk together, stay together, and try also to find solution for their problems. So sometimes it seems that these solutions are very, uh, as, as sort of ghetto. But in some cases it's help to understand which are the needs and to go on and to present uh, new ideas. And finally, and so I arrived to my third word, <laughs> there's an experience uh, in Rome that is called Liberinantes, that is an association who work with refugees doing activities in the field of football, touch rugby, trekking in the mountains. And why I want to finish before the presentation of my video with uh, the word happiness is because Princess, she was a, a refugee from Nigeria, um, one day said, I love sport. And for me, sport is health. Health is wellness. Wellness is happiness. So she perfectly drew, which is the idea that we uh, carry on. So now, because for us, we are all catchers of clouds, we can say. I want to show a short. Uh, I want to show you a short video, and the title track is, in Italian is "We are all catcher of clouds," just to leave you with a sense of happiness, because you will see the photos are very nice. So I don't know who has to broadcast the video. Siamo tutti cacciatori di nuvole. Mille più tramonti, gira insieme ai delfini, laggiù è l'orizzonte, oltre i confini del mondo. Tra queste casse di rum, io il mio capitano. Prepariamo la sorte, prepariamo la fuga perché noi partiremo quando si alzerà il vento, lasceremo anche qui 
questa stazione Partiremo quando si alzerà il vento E se non si alza il vento useremo, useremo il pensiero Tra noi mai si fermerà Perché noi, noi Cacciatori di nuvole Non fermiamo mai questo Tra noi mai si fermerà Le giornate sul ponte Sono fredde e veloci Il profumo dei fiori è un ricordo come raggi di sole E porti siamo banditi Non conosciamo la ragione Ma voi restate col culo per terra Voi non avete opinione Mentre noi partiremo si alzerà If, uh, if you agree, and uh, yes, we have a, uh, a question concerning the, the MOO project, and the question is, uh, do you think that the, the government, uh, I think that uh, is referring, generally speaking, to a national government, should create a health program uh, that can run in parallel with the, the MOO project, I think in supporting the, the MOO project to some extent? No. <laughs> <laughs> I can say a little bit more. <laughs> if you want. <laughs> I like to say Thank that you. we have fiscal inactivity enough for everybody. Okay. So I don't think it's uh, clever to exclude anybody that wants to do a good job. And I think national governments and governments generally speaking have a key role uh, to play. I also think that national governments should consider how they can best use exploit, uh, make the best of civil society or third sector organizations. I believe that bottom-up uh, local grassroots sports organizations are more and better equipped to deliver official activity opportunities and sport to their communities than government or municipal entities. So I would encourage partnerships with NGOs to deliver fiscal activity opportunities and I would strongly encourage also non-governmental organizations to push, advocate uh, for their governments to focus on uh, physical activity more uh, to address this problem, which we've heard today really is uh, the key health issue. The best thing one person can do for his health is to keep physically active. It's not my words, it's the words of a professor from the US. And so if this is the case, let's try and work together to deliver physical activities, push in a friendly manner governments to focus, finance, and in some instances also organize opportunities and legal frameworks for physical activity. Uh, the MOVE project will not solve all the world's problems. Hopefully it will be a piece of the puzzle, and I'm sure governments if they speak well enough internally, will be uh, able to uh, contribute to the solution of this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, I have been informed that we have only 10 minutes, uh, so we have to be quick, but let's try to, to have uh, other questions. And uh, we got the questions for Anne. Anna, sorry. Uh, and this question is from Aimer. Uh, 
In, Bra in Brazil, there is a strong action to increase the practice of football, volleyball, basketball, handball, the fantastic four. Uh, regarding this situation, uh, how uh, your institute uh, work to, to promote uh, all the other sports? Well, to tell you the truth, um, the educational sport, um, the, the kind of sport used, that's the end of the strategy. The principles, the strategy, uh, and the methodology of the educational sport is, is the most important thing in our vision, and it focuses and it applies to any modality, sport modality. So we're not really... Um, attached to having a certain um, volleyball teams, basketball teams, but we have all of those. And what we promote um, in these spaces and um, in the training, we also work with training, um, what we try is to expand, broaden people's knowledge of sports, and so to have projects that have different kinds of sports. Like now in Brazil, starting 2007, we had the Pan American Games, and then we had the Olympics Games. Now we're gonna have the Olympics. So there's always a moment there where the children and the young people are attuned to what's playing on TV or to these big events. And that's a good opportunity for us to um, ex broaden um, their horizons to sports that are not so well known. Um, sword fighting, rugby, water sports, radical sports. Um, so we work a lot with projects in regards to this. And just to emphasize that the, the, the kind of sport is the end of the strategy. The, it's important for competition and the, and the school games and the regional games and up the, the pyramid. But when it comes to, to, to motor education and leisure and sports for all, it's not really the focus. What we try to do is to broaden people's horizons of what they know, they try and build material, research. Um, that's what we try to work with. Thank you. Okay, faster. Uh, then we have a question for Alessandre. Uh, during your, your presentation, you underline the fact that uh, urbanization can influence uh, uh, the level of physical activities and the rate of uh, people that are more active in the population. Can you explain us in which, in which way is possible uh, and how the city can influence this aspect? It's evident that when you talk about urban spaces, the, the construction of a center for health gym, for example, is not going to solve the problem to, of offering the population as a whole the access to these spaces. The ministry of city ministry approved at the beginning of the year a new um, general plan for which uh, cities with more than 20,000 inhabitants need to follow. And this plan takes into consideration um, the construction of health spaces, green areas, parks, uh, sidewalks, so that people can, can have uh, mobility in the city, it's a dilemma. In Europe, we there's an effort so that people use the active um, um, transport as a as an option for for mobility, and the cities have a certain dilemma. So we need to in our discu discussion about um, building these gyms, we really put an effort to involve other sectors as well, other sectors of society. So the Ministry of Sports has been a ministry that we've had lots of conversations with. The education, due to the space of the school, the school is a strategic um, environment to promote health and 
and education and teach them better life lifestyle so like the active transport bicycle transport so building um bicycle lanes um programs for um community um biking where where people can commute together we have that here in sazi um the idea of building the infrastructure for bicycles where you can park your bicycle safely um building um different lanes for for buses and metro are alternatives that have been recognized by the World Health Organization as strategies to promote healthy le lifestyles in the city. Um, so we need to adapt these cities so that people change their lifestyle, so that they stop using cars so much as a means of transportation. There are very interesting studies. I was in Brasilia. In Brasilia, we talk a lot about the transport because it's a planned city. Um, it's, it's ridiculous that we do not have a, 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 a system for for buses, a lane just for buses. It's, it's an absurd that a city like Brasilia doesn't have um, bicycle lanes that motivates people to use their bicycles as a means of transportation. It's, an, it's ridiculous that a city does not offer this to their population, and that's something. Um, here in Sao Paulo, there's a, a more organized movement for, for biking, and this has forced the local um, government to recognize the bicycle as a means of transport. So the bicycle lanes that exist today here in Sao Paulo it's, they are conquest, um, but it's necessary, but we need to to transform this in more effective um, measures. The metro that receives the bicycles um, starting at 8 o'clock during the week and starting at from 2 on Saturday and Sunday all day all day long doesn't have an, an adapted um, car to receive the bicycle. So you need a set of actions from the government um, because to prevent health, um, health pro chronic health problems is something that must be done together um, by society, for the, by the public uh, power, and um, and people need to participate of this. So the transformation of the urban space in the cities in health space, healthy space that motivates people to have a lifestyle that is more healthy and active, it's determined. It's significant for the success of the strategy. I appreciate the, the question very much and it's a very good answer. I would like to supplement that sometimes we see barriers, barriers to keep people physically active. And if you observe that cities generally tend to make people less physically active, or you observe that maybe TVs or computers tend to make people less physically active, what are we going to do about it? Well, we can try to ban cities, we can try to make TVs illegal, but I think my message here is, let's try and work with what we can reasonably easily do and think a little bit creatively. And what you mentioned here are some good examples of creative solutions inside the cities. And let's work with TV and computers to make them help us to keep people informed and physically active. So uh, just to comment, let's keep solutions workable instead of uh, banning the impossible. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much also for, for your feedbacks. Uh, I think this one is a very important, it's a crucial topic. It's something that uh, need to be, need to first analyze and, uh, but uh, yes, unfortunately we don't have time for, for going to this specific topic. So if you have more questions, if uh, you are interesting, uh, you can have an interaction with our speakers. Uh, now we have a question uh, for, for, for Daniela. That is about, uh, yeah, uh, you underline the fact that uh, we need to integrate uh, migrants and that uh, we need to integrate other, cu other, other cultures. But then how is it possible to combine uh, uh, this process of integration with the fact that we have to uh, preserve what uh, we call the laudo, laudo diversity, it means the, the diversity that are in terms of body culture, just to give you an example. Now in Italy, we have a lot of people coming from Asia, and they, they play cricket, 
and the Italians are a little bit crazy for that because they say people uh, using a strange language, uh, playing a sport that is different for football, so they really believe that they are crazy. <laughs> so how can we combine these two aspects uh, just to preserve also very loud diversity? How many hours have got to <laughs> answer to this question? Three minutes. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, diversity is, um, um, is a richness. So I think that it's important to include uh, people and leave people the possibility to, to, to do what they really want to do. And uh, I can keep your example about cricket because I've got a funny story coming from Ancona, that is a nice town um, in Italy, in the central part of Italy, um, a group of uh, guys start with this anti-racist activities and they were fans of the Ancona football, of course. And, uh, and they try to involve the, the migrant population to go to the football matches, buying free tickets and so on. At a certain point, they try, and with the Asian population, there's a lot of Pakistan and Bangladesh people in, and Indian, of course, in, uh, in Ancona. At a certain point, this guy said, okay, it's nice to go to a football match, but we don't know anything about our sport is cricket. So this group said, okay, we can try to have a cricket uh, team. And so they start to having this cricket team. And they participate to a tournament, and they become stronger, stronger. And at a certain point, they represent the city of Ancona in a cricket tournament, and the population recognizes them because, of course, there's lo lots of uh, uh, news on the local newspaper. And some of the local people said, "Oh, but you are the, the one that you manage a bar or a shop, and you are the great winner of the match." And so. This is a sort of, of course, this is a long process. I'm talking something happened a few years ago, but that's the way in which we think that it's important to give people the possibility to do and to express to your, themselves, of course, maintaining the diversity that every of us has. So that's it. Thank you very much. As you can see, I, I, I got tons of questions, but unfortunately, the time is over. So if you want to put your questions and if you want to have a, a direct interaction with them of course they are they are they are they are ready and <laughs> you are more than welcome uh, as i said time is over thank you very much for participating uh, i think we can give another round big round of applause to our prominent speakers <laughs> and enjoy the rest of congress